we're trying to translate what's on the written page. It comes through our eyeballs, to our brain. But really what we're doing when we're making music is we're making physical motions. We're putting an instrument into motion to create sonic waves for the ear. Welcome to another episode of Contrabass Conversations, your show covering life on the low end of the spectrum. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and I really appreciate you tuning in. And visit our site at ContrabassConversations.com for all the details about what's going on here. And I love to hear people's stories and learn from their stories and share their stories. And I'd love it if you reached out and told me your story. And you can do that by emailing me at feedback at ContrabassConversations.com. And I know you're going to love today's story featuring Hans Sturm. Now, Hans teaches bass at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and he's the former International Society of Bases president, but that only scratches the surface of Hans. And we've known each other for years. I think I first met Hans when I was 18. I remember seeing his doctoral recital in Northwestern, where he'd been studying with Jeff Bradditch. And then fast forward 13 years later, and Hans ends up inviting me to join the ISB board of directors, where I served for six years. And during that time, this was back in 2007, Hans and I were hanging out at my place in Evanston, Illinois, and we decided to film a set of videos covering the major Raboth technique concepts. And I love these videos. They're a great window into the Raboth technique, and they're basically Hans giving me a lesson on the Raboth technique. And they've been viewed about 50,000 times all told. And if you haven't checked them out, do some, follow the link in the show notes. They're great. You'll see a couple of cat bombs uh, in the video and all sorts of good stuff. They're a lot of fun, and they're, very, they're a great window into the Raboth technique. So I've sort of had Hans on the podcast in a sense through these videos, but we never actually sat down and done an in-depth interview before. And folks, this is a good one. We go so deep into Hans's teaching, his major influences, his relationship with Francois Raboth, which led to the art of the bow and the art of the left hand. I could go on and on, but I'll tell you, conversations like this are exactly why I love doing this podcast. It is just so much fun talking shop with Hans. Such a great way to spend your time. And even that opening quote I played shows you just how passionate Hans is about the bass, schools of pedagogy, and this bass revolution that we're living in. And as you listen to this interview, just listen to how committed he is to education and to continually furthering his own education throughout all these chapters in his life, from his time working with Richard Davis, Jeff Bradditch, and Francois Raboth to the genesis of his most recent album, A Day in Paris, which we cover later in the interview. And speaking of that album, you're going to hear some excerpts from A Day in Paris. Great album. Highly recommended. Tons of variety. Also features Raboth's second bass concerto, which he recently dedicated to Hans. So you'll hear an excerpt from that too with you know, Sylvain Raboth on piano. I know you're going to enjoy this album and I know you're going to enjoy this excellent conversation with Hans Sturm. Tell folks what your first musical instrument was and where you grew up and all those early details. <laughs> the dark ages. The dark ages, exactly. So, right. So I, I grew up in a small town, relatively small town in central Pennsylvania, Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, home of uh, Bucknell University. And uh, it's right on the Susquehanna River. I grew up in an old house, 1786 Fieldstone House, right on the on Water Street, overlooking the Susquehanna River. And uh, my first instrument was, well, I guess I had several. I'm not sure which one was first. I played piano and violin, and then I guess a little bit later did percussion. And then uh, bass didn't come around until, until later in high school. I got sucked into it by a very creative uh, band director. I was looking for someone to play bass in the concert band, and then also in the jazz band. And I was 
hanging out in the band room and singing in the choir and doing all the musical stuff that we all uh, that we all do. And he said, oh, I really need a bass player. We didn't have a bass player. And, and his comment to me was, well, you know, a bass is tuned just like a violin, only backwards. And so I was, I was uh, gullible enough to pick it up. And it's sort of like, a, you know, years ago, I read an interview with Ray Brown talking about his first experience with the bass, where he said that there must have been some bulldog in that bass because it, it, it grabbed a hold and never let go. And that's kind of how I, how, how I kind of feel about it. I mean, I, I did go off to college and I didn't, I didn't study the bass you know, for, for quite some time, but I was still playing it. And I transferred a few times until I finally decided this is, this is really what I want to do. I really want to play. What gave you that spark? What was that, what was that moment for you? Was it a particular person or an event or? I'm, I, you know, that's a good question. I can't say that it was a particular event. It was just that, you know, with the, with the violin, the violin was always very competitive and, and Pennsylvania is a, a, a big state. And when you have, you know, there's like the districts and regionals and all state kinds of experiences. And, and I had done all of that. And, you know, you have Philadelphia on the one side of the state and Pittsburgh on the other. And there are a lot of high powered players in both those cities that do very well. And, and there was just this kind of, you know, the, the competitive nature. And with the bass, everybody needed a bass right away. And I was playing lots of fun, different music right away. I was playing in the jazz band and I was, I was playing in the concert band and that was fine. And, and, and I was doing well and I, I was having a great time. But when I got out in, into college, well, I guess, I guess I can say, I can point to, I was, I, I did go to the Pennsylvania governor's school for the arts and that's a summer high intensity five week summer program. And I got in on violin and I was playing a lot of violin and studying with a member of the Philadelphia Orchestra and all of that. But I was where I was having the most fun was hanging out jamming. And that's where that's where I first met Don Owens, in, uh, who was the director of jazz studies at Northwestern back in 1976. And then didn't reconnect with him until I showed up at Northwestern in, in 92 doing my doctorate and embarrassed him by telling him that, that <laughs> he had taught me in 76. Like, <laughs> no, man, you're... <laughs> you know, I'm not that old. <laughs> so I, I guess I guess that was really the pivotal thing, but I didn't it didn't really sink in. I mean, I went off to Middlebury College in Vermont, um, but then that summer after, uh, I went out with a couple of guys from there was the the School of the Blind uh, associated with Duquesne in Pittsburgh, and uh, Jim Holmey and Ed Friedenberger, and, and we we spent a summer together with this uh, drummer Chip Hickson. Well, I'm surprised I can remember these names. <laughs> anyway, so Chip, Chip wound up to have a professional career as a percussionist and I guess later as an administrator with a group called Up With People. I don't know how many the old folks might remember Up, Up With People, they're people wherever you go. You know, it's like they did a Super Bowl back in the day. And, nice. um, so that was, and, and so then I, I kind of decided that's what I wanted to do. So after two years at Millbury, I went to uh, Cincinnati Conservatory and I was there for I was there for a year that they, they were having financial problems. But I learned a lot and, and, and played with a lot of great people who have gone. Uh, Todd Reed, I think, is out in Denver area. And uh, Bill Peterson teaches down in Florida now. And uh, Mark Douthat, the saxophone player I, I, I played with all that year, he's the uh, plays with uh, Michael McDonald. Oh, all right. Uh, I, nice. I was on the road with him. You know, so he's like a fixture on the Nationals. So there were a lot of, of heavies, but the program was, was, was having a lot of problems. And that's when my father had sent me this uh, New York Times article about Richard Davis at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. It was really intriguing because he played. I didn't know him. I knew the records. I knew the Thad Jones and Mel Lewis stuff because of my experiences in Cincinnati, but I really didn't know the depth and range of the material that he had done until later. And, and of course, this is all, you know, before the interwebs. Right. Yeah. Say. So I had, you know, I really didn't, I really didn't have a clue, but started digging around and, and decided, Oh, I really, I really want to, I really want to get further into this. And so I went up and finished an undergraduate and then uh, freelanced for a couple of years. I lived with uh, Stanley Jordan. Some people may remember that name, great guitarist and uh, worked with him. Uh, this is before he got signed to Bluno. He was the first artist to be signed to Bluno when they came back, when uh, after Capitol records, EMI took them over Bruce Lundvall. He was the first artist to, Sign with him, but I was working with him, living with him, and uh, John Tuline, who was the piano player with the What Do You Know show. He's famous, famous for that. But anyway, we we were together in Madison. I worked with them a lot, and with Joan Wildman. It was a very fertile time, and uh, she was very, very influential. I worked in her trio uh, with uh, Dane Richardson, and then 
uh, Roscoe Mitchell. I spent, boy, I'd probably the better part of eight to 10 years, four days a week, I'd go over to his house and we we just work on, on warm-ups and he'd be working on material and I'd be working on material that would share ideas. And, but we would be doing, um, oh, uh, I turned him on to the Golami and Arpeggio sequence and he turned me on to Sigurd Rauscher's top tones for saxophone. So I, you know, I'm working on long bows with him and, and he's into the circular breathing thing. And, and then we would do, oh, he'd play some... Um, uh, classical flute. Uh, he was really into Baroque stuff at the time. Uh, but then also, of course, he's, he was one of the founders of the AACM, the Association for the Next Pre- out, out of Chicago. But he would also do these uh, um, super avant-garde things. So he was very influential as well. And I got, you know, I started working on the classical chops on the upright, which I hadn't done. I'd only, really only been playing a lot of jazz, but I had violin stuff. So that carried over to a certain point and I got busier and busier. And I was working then at that point, you know, quite a lot. You get to a when you get to a place where you have enough technique and have enough knowledge and so on, you can begin to freelance. And so I was working with the Madison Symphony Orchestra and Wisconsin Chamber Orchestra. And then eventually, uh, after I finished the master's degree, I taught for a year at uh, Augustana College in the Quad Cities. I think Paul Sharp followed me after after I left. But I really wanted to I, I really wanted to get deeper into the music, and I had been to the ISB convention in Evanston in 84 and was very impressed by Jeff Bratitich. So then I went to go study with, with Jeff at Northwestern first as a, in, in the performance certificate program and then realized that one, that was a one year program, realized that, that was not enough time. Went through then the next set of hoops, which were a series of exams to get into the doctoral program. I think I was his one doctoral student while he was at Northwestern. Of course, at UNT since then, he's, he's been doing a lot more. But uh, that was a, a great period for me because Jeff is such a, such a wonderful teacher, his technique, and it was what I needed at the time. I was very fortunate in looking back that the teachers that I kind of needed to show me what I needed appeared in those times. But Jeff was, Jeff was terrific. That's cool. What, wasn't that the first, that 84 convention, that was the first actual ISB convention convention, right? Wasn't that, wasn't that the first? I, 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 I want to say yes. I mean, there was the Mingus Zimmerman stuff and that, that was, that, that had happened earlier. And I can remember because when I was at Madison, Peter Dominguez was there. He teaches at, at, at Oberlin. I was at Michigan State before that. And he had gone into the competition, and Lucas Drew heard him and invited him to uh, to go down to, to foot. So, I mean, there there was that. And, that. and I think that was where a lot of folks got introduced to Rabat for the first time, was in Cincinnati with Barry Green and, and Frank Proto. But those weren't, I don't think, weren't branded ISB. I mean, I think that was... You know, because the ISB, I mean, Gary, you know, of course, founding it, and I think, you know, Barry taking it over for a long time and trying to keep the thing going, and uh, then Jeff taking it over, and, you know, these guys like Terry Barbet in, in Paris, you know, you know, running it pretty much single-handedly until it got to the place where it was so big, but 84 was wonderful. That was, I, I, got, I, got, I got a lot out of that. Oh, I'll bet. I'll bet. And what a great influence Richard Davis must have been on you, just because you have such an eclectic background. And with the, I didn't realize that you'd played violin for that long. You were a serious violinist if you were going off and stu- That's That's really cool. But like Richard, I mean, it seems like he would have been a perfect person to work with at that point, just in terms of all the interests you have. Yeah, he, you know, it was working with Richard was intense. Those that have worked with him each each person's experience with him is is a, is a little bit a little bit different. I mean, of course, the relationships, teacher student relationships, and, and and I appreciate that. I mean, as a teacher, I tried to be that also. My lessons with him were technically oriented, you know, classically oriented. You know, the the, the chops. I mean, he he had studied in Chicago and in New York and had this career going both ways where, you know, he, he performed with the New York Phil subbing, you know, under Leonard Bernstein. He had had, you know, these opportunities with uh, Stravinsky, you know, at the same time, his stuff with Sarah Vaughn and the singer thing, but then also with Eric Dolphy and the cutting edge kind of stuff with the big band, the straight ahead stuff, but also as a serious reader and a serious electric bass player, you know, playing with Bruce Springsteen and Van Morrison. So he brought, you know, an enormous, enormous amount of intellect and experience to the table. And uh, so that was very inspiring. My lessons didn't necessarily reflect all of that, except the importance of, of fundamentals. 
But Richard was also from the perspective when you're dealing in the studio of you have to do what you need to do in order to get the right note out at the right time. Mm, yeah. So in terms of like uh, the specificity of, uh, for instance, Jeff's pedagogy, you know, he has his book out now and so on, and you can, you know, his, his technical exercises and all that kind of business. My technique, I needed that. When, when Jeff came around, I needed that kind of more specific focus, you know, for somebody who had really thought about it. And that, the combination of, of that, but I think also in Madison, besides working with Jeff, was the cellist with the Pro Arte String Quartet, Lowell Kreitz. He team taught a class with Tyrone Greaves on string pedagogy. And I, my violin stuff, I had that, but I didn't know what I had. You know, you, when you go through the violin world, it's like, you know, there's a certain prescription. You've got Dante and Matsus and Kreutzer, and you, you go through this hierarchy of etudes. And so in bass world, you know, we don't necessarily have that. You know, we have got, we've got bass teachers saying, you know, hey, really super heavyweights talking about how creating your own etudes from the bars that are giving you difficulty is going to take you further than actually studying a bunch of etudes. That resonates with a lot of bass teachers, I think. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? That's such a difference. We're at such a younger point in the evolutionary cycle of the pedagogy, I guess, compared to those cello, violin, piano. Oh, I, I agree. But I think, I think, frankly, in our world, you know, having taught in academia for a long time, what we have in the bass world is actually in the, in the large picture, large overview, is healthier. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. For, for instance, you know, all the stuff, my interest in scales and arpeggios and, and, and all the kinds of things that I work, using things that I've taken from Francois and, and from Jeff, but to be able to think about the bass, you know, when I go into these juries forever and ever, it doesn't really doesn't matter, the violin, you know, you've got the Fleisch and Galamian, and students are playing scales with prescribed fingerings. And I want students to understand, and this is kind of getting, this is kind of going another direction, which is fine, but I want students to have an understanding of ways how the fingerings work so you can choose the fingering that you wish to have. And we, we spoke about this a little bit in the videos where we talked about tetrachord versus pivot. But then you have more flexibility in your technique to handle the variety of situations that come down the pike. Rather than if I only have this way how to finger the scale, you know, that doesn't necessarily help you develop the imagination to come up with a fingering that will result in interpretive intention. I'm going to finger it this way because I want the sound to come this way. I want to, I talk a lot about one string fingering, two string fingering, three string fingering. It, it makes a difference how the, how the piece sounds rather than I have to do it this way because this is the way, you know, yeah. my teacher's 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 <laughs> teacher was your welcome and he fingered it this way. So you should too. You know? Right. Exactly. Yeah. What's the line? What's the Francois line? The, the more ways you have to play, the more you are more rich you are. The more rich you are. The more you are rich. I, I, I love yeah. that. I love that. Yeah. When did you first... So you're studying with Jeff. You're, you were studying with Richard. You were freelancing. You decided to go back to school and studying with Jeff. And at what point did you first discover Raboth or see him play or learn about his teachings? Yeah, so that would have been in Madison because it was through that string pedagogy class. And I was the only bass player in that class. And I had to take it twice. I had to take it once as an undergraduate. And then when I did my master's degree, it was required to the master's degree. And there were no substitutions at that time. But I didn't care because I had gotten so much out of it. And so I was doing these papers, these projects on bass pedagogy and going back and reading these articles and learning about, you know, all of these the schools of Samantha Bohemian school and uh, the Italian Belay school and the French Nani school and, and learning about these pieces in the Paris Conservatory that are written each year that are a competition. And I didn't know any of this existed. Well, but that was about the time that the third volume came out, which would have been 80, I want to say 83 ish. He had come out with the first volume earlier. And when, and, and I, I don't know in subsequent conversations with, with Francois, you know, he, uh, LeDuc went to him because he said, you know, we published uh, Nani, and if you play at this level, you should also do a method book. And Francois has his stories with Paul Ellison and so on. Uh, you, you know, he, he wasn't a teacher, he was a player. And so he had to go back and look at other method books to see how they were written in order to create something. 
And it wasn't until much later now that he looks back and he says, you know, that way of starting a student in the low position and you're working your way up is not healthy because what that means is high equals hard. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And and frankly, the notes are closer together up there. And if the action is reasonable that you can play up there, I mean, if you're not going for, you know, super, you know, macho, uh, stiff string orchestra, pound, you know, uh, heavy thing, you know, for, for the young ones, especially if you're trying to do something gymnastic, but even for the young ones, just to be able to be free on the instrument. And I think that's where the collaboration with George was so important because George made that connection between Suzuki. He studied with Suzuki in, in Japan and brought, Suzuki with Rabat together, and I think that was that was quite brilliant. But anyway, it was it was at Madison where I first came, and and went through the went through the three volumes. I mean, I I was really into it, and I played through I played through everything. I didn't know what I was doing though. I mean, I really didn't understand, and and that was later than the impetus for the for for the DVDs because I appreciate Rabat. I loved that first vinyl record that he made of the Bach in Cincinnati with Proto in the church. If you can find it, it's just it's beautiful playing. It's one of my, still one of my all time favorites. Uh, but it wasn't until later when I really connected with him. I mean, I heard, uh, Sandor Ostland who teaches at Baylor, wonderful bass player, great teacher had been a student of mine in Madison when he was a kid and uh, went on to do great things. And they had sweet week. I want to say it was, it was Iowa, uh, Diana Gannett's uh, convention. I can't remember the year, 97, 99, maybe, 2001, a bass odyssey. It would have been before that. That was Indianapolis. But anyway, so Sandor played the fourth box suite at pitch and played it beautifully. I was like, Sandor, <laughs> <laughs> you're kicking my butt. What happened, man? <laughs> and he said, well, he, he, had, he had done his degree with Richard, and then he went down and studied at Rice with Paul, and he had just gotten back from Paris. And he said, well, you need to meet the boss. And so that's when... I went down and took some lessons with, with Paul, and then I went to George Vance's program in Washington, D.C. as a student, and George called me. He said, look, I know you. I know what you're teaching. I know, I, we, we, he said, I, I would be happy to have you come and teach. And I said, no, I really want to come attend oh, uh, nice. as a student. Yeah. I, want, I want to learn as a student. And so uh, I was helped by uh, you know, folks you know, younger than me here. I'm you know, coming to the table, still trying to expand and to work. And Nick Walker was very, very helpful, mm -hmm. you know, to me with understanding all of this. And Francois, you know, Francois got that way about him. He goes, right. Why? Why you do that that way? <laughs> you need to come to Paris. Yeah. <laughs> so I said, okay. All right. And so I would go a couple times a year. And, and that's where then I became interested enough to say, you know, from a pedagogical perspective, you know, there's some things here that if you're just looking at the books, you're not getting. And there should be something that should be out there because, you know, to be able to afford to go to Paris to have a lesson, it's prohibitively expensive. And he's only one guy. And even if you go there and you have a lesson, he will teach you where you are, but that's not necessarily where you dream to be. And you know what I mean? It's like, we, we need, we need something. We need to create something. And it, you know, it's, it's for also for selfish reasons, because I was, really interested in in how does it how does it work yeah you know That's what's so cool about those DVDs, because it really is how does it work, right? Like the the physics and the, I just think that's such a brilliant idea, just the both the art of the bow and the art of the left hand. Maybe it'd be great if people haven't checked out those DVDs, just talk a little bit about how you got the idea and then like how, how those DVDs work. <laughs> sure, I, I would be delighted. I mean, the, the story is, so I'm, I'm with Francois and, you know... It, when you look at the music and, the, and what he asks of your left hand, the art of the bow came up first, and here's why. When you're looking at the left hand and you see a string indication and a finger indication, you have a basic idea of what you need to do. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. You get it. Yeah. But when you un- when you unfold the cover to the third volume and you see you know two hundred and sixty odd Boeing variations, <laughs> right? And you 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 have a slur with dots and you have a slur with dashes. You don't know what that means. There's no way of knowing. And also, this is this whole thing now that I'm I'm on this. I've been on this kick for the past couple of years about asking people how you know what you know. Mm, yeah. uh, and, I'll, and I'll just cut to the chase because you, typically it, it, it's a circular answer and I just open that up, you know, sort of Socratic, but basically it's our senses. Uh-huh. And the, the, the issue with the printed page is that we have five, we have our five senses, right? And mm-hmm. I say all the time, unless you're playing stinks or isn't bad taste, we don't worry about yeah, right. those two. Yeah, exactly. That leaves us with three. <laughs> we have the tactile, we have the oral, and of course we have the visual. And what does the written page do? Well, the written page, we're, we're trying to translate what's on the written page. It comes through our eyeballs, to our brain. But really what we're doing when we're making music is we're making physical motions. We're putting an instrument into motion to create sonic waves for the ear. It's really those two. And the eyes can get, the eyes can get in the way. But people are visual learners. You know, that's, that's part of it too. Anyway, so I'm, I'm, off on this, I'm off on this huge tangent. But to figure out what's happening, you don't know the sound when you're looking at the music and you don't know what's happening with the bow. And so he was demonstrating these things and, and I was working at it. And, and he said to me at the end of that lesson, he said, you know, this is my fear that I'm not going to be able to transmit my bow arm. You know, I'm not going to be able to share my bow arm. And of course, you know, my, my dark sense of humor, I'm like, oh, no, no, that's, that's a, you know, we're all going to take a piece of the DNA as, as soon as you're gone. <laughs> we're all going to have a piece of Francois, you know, I'm sure we'll come up with something, you know, somebody will come up with something. Anyway, and I'm thinking about this, how do we teach the motion? And thinking about, you know, for instance, Barry Green's books, he tried to do that on a two-dimensional page. You have the photograph, but then you have the drawing, you know, of, of how the motion should look like. So anyway, I'm, I'm on the plane, I'm ready to fly home, and there's a problem with the park, and you know, the, the story goes, you know, so it's, it's France and it's noontime and we're not going to get the part until after the lunch hour is over because that's just France. Sure, right. So I'm looking for something. Please give me something to read. They hand me this golf magazine. And there's an article about the new Tiger Woods video game. And they show, I mean, new back then. Right, <laughs> they show right. Tiger and his swing and they show him in the skin tight reflective markers. And then they show a picture of the graphic from the game. And I'm like, that's it. Uh-huh. That's the motion capture. If they can do this for this silly game, we should be able to do it for the, because, and it turns out in golf, this is a thing that's everywhere because you, you, you have every hinge and everything. So you can go to some upscale golf store or something and they'll analyze your swing using basic biomechanics animation. So I got back to Ball State and we have a human performance laboratory. And so I made a cold call. And uh, uh, got in there and started working on it. And, you know, Francois is a gadget king. You know, he travels with a couple of laptops and everything. So when I showed him what we had done, of course, his first thing is he looks at my, my motion. He says, why do you move like that? <laughs> <laughs> right. But I, I, I talked to him about, about this. And, and he's, of course, he's very, very interested in this may be a way how to, how to share. Yeah. But then for, for me, it was... I want the DVD to be very special. I want it to have as many aspects as we could have. So biomechanics animation is one thing. But I also learned that there is a button on these DVD remote controls called the angle button. Well, it's rarely used. But it turns out that you can do this. If you have multiple cameras shooting simultaneously and they are synced up, then you, in the DVD you can create the possibility to change angles on the fly as you're watching the DVD. You can choose the angle. And so we shot with a four-camera shoot in surround. And uh, it took us months to figure this out because this was possible and Apple said it was possible. And I'm working with my, with my brother-in-law, with Randy Allen, out in uh, San Luis Obispo, who works for one of the public TV stations because he's doing video editing. Anyway, we were successful, but it took us a long time. The issue with the art of the boat a little bit, but it wound up being... I don't know. Sometimes when an accident happens or you're not successful in one way, it winds up being a plus in another. And one of the issues that we had was when you do the biomechanics animations, the uh, motion capture is at a much higher resolution, much, much faster than normal video. And so we didn't have a way to capture the sound and the audio and the visual at the same time because regular video, it's 27, 28 frames per second. 
this is more along the lines. This is more than 100 frames a second. And so we didn't have a way how to do that. The, the software wasn't uh, at that place. But it was, it was a tremendous... So anyway, we have uh, live performances on there. We have interviews where he talks about all kinds of things. Uh, nervousness, uh, how to teach, a lot of different aspects. We have the biomechanics animations. We have the lecture, and then we have the lecture demonstrations with the multiple camera angles. And it's, it's a very kind of complete way. You, you can look at his seven families of bow strokes. You can switch. So looking at him from front on as if you're watching a player in a recital. You can uh, look very closely at his bow arm from the front. You can look at his bow arm uh, from the back of the bow arm to see what the hand is doing. And then we got a cherry picker and we had a guy up looking over his shoulder down at his bow arm so you can get a sort of a perspective of what does it look like from the player's perspective oh, as well. Yeah, that's great. And then with the biomechanics animations, there's, it's, it, it runs sequentially. And so for each of the seven families, there are all these subdivisions. And one of the things that you can do with the... Um, uh, with the video, if you want, is you can set A and B points. You can set start and stop points and loop it. And one of the things that you have with the biomechanics animation is a, a mirror image. So you can have the screen uh, with a mirror image, A bead, next to a mirror, and you can see how your motion interfaces with the motion. Now, bearing in mind that it's, I mean, this is not, this is not an avatar budget. Right. right. So right, right, this right. is kind of basic thing. But if you have the imagination, you can see what's happening. We're, we're all sticks and, you know, sticks with hinges. And so uh, understanding those motions. So anyway, it took five years to do the art of the bow and uh, it, it was finished and replicated and got out there. But these, these are Ball State uh, products. It was uh, unveiled at the George Vance a summer program. And at the very end of the, of the week, Francois has a gathering with all the parents and all the kids. And, and so he takes a moment to speak about, about the DVD and how excited he is for this. And he, he turns to me and he says, and now we must do the left hand. <laughs> oh no, another five years. <laughs> I know, well, and that's what it, that's pretty much what it took, you know, uh, but that's, that's a, it's a little bit that the, the, uh, the technology had moved on again. And, uh, so we did, we did two, it's a two DVD set that one. So the, the, the biomechanics animations exist on another DVD. And then we had uh, uh, live on the company stuff he plays. It was incredible. I mean, the guy has got stamina still phenomenal. So, um, so now we have for the left hand also. That's, that stamina thing, it's amazing because I think right now, as we're recording this, I think we're about 85 right now. Is, or is he's somewhere mm-hmm. around there. And like that's one of the first words I think of when I think of robot, Or even like Paul, you know, 75, that's not 25. But those guys, they can play all day. And I just think that that speaks volumes just about the, the technique, the approach in general. Like how right. – and I, I think I saw a DVD or saw a video or something of Raboff playing a concert maybe maybe ten years ago. He's playing for two hours. He's playing this stuff that yeah. a, a fifteen year old student of mine would, would would be exhausted after like eight minutes of playing. And then here's somebody up there. That alone should give anybody pause thinking about. Oh, technology. totally. Yeah, totally. And his his whole thing is using weight, not muscle. Because if you use muscle one day, you're feeling stronger than the other day, it's going to change. And so uh, he's all about using weight. No, still, it, you know, I, this year he's doing three in the States. This week he's in New Jersey. And then in uh, next week he'll be in Kansas City and the week after in St. Paul before he goes up to uh, Domain Forger where he, uh, he goes, you know, to spend, a, I don't know how long, a couple weeks, three weeks there before he flies home. You know, last year he came and he did, oh, Santa Fe and Austin and Lincoln. He came in the second time here. He played a concert, the Twin Cities and uh, and every place, Oberlin and uh, Kansas City. So it was, it was huge. Every place that he went, he played a 90-minute recital, no intermission from memory. 
I mean, it was just, yeah. just, just in, in, in 84, you know, I, yeah. come on. <laughs> it's just, it's just, yeah, it's just amazing and great. I mean, he's he's all over the instrument. It's it's interesting how now he's doing a lot more uh, collaborative composing with Sylvain, and I'm hoping that you know the next volume, the next volume, we, we've got there's six now out of his method, and now he's publishing things that hadn't been published earlier uh, and rethinking things and so on. But he's come back around, you know, to where he's been for for a long time very virtuosic and, and the intricate uh, off the string pieces for the, for the bow and, um, you know, uh, really intricate virtuosic things for the, for the left hand. Now he's kind of coming back full circle to the music with that he played when he came, when he first came to, uh, to Paris years ago with Charles Osnavar. I mean, he's, he loves the American songbook. And so he's interested in writing pieces that are still concert pieces and there's still stuff in them. But they're very melodic. It's a departure from the, uh, you know, the incredible virtuosity. He still plays that material. Don't get me wrong. He's still playing that. He's still playing Bach. He's still, you know, he's, but where, where he's kind of generally heading is, is in a more lyrical place. And I think that has to do with that and also the opera, his experience playing the opera for so many years. Yeah, well, and he wasn't he weren't he and Terry on the same stand in the opera for many years. I I, I just interviewed uh, t- Terry Barbet about, and he was mentioning that he and Francois played together for a long time. Could very well be. I mean, it was not until you know uh, uh, later. I mean, so Paris was two thousand eight, uh, based two thousand eight, and I had done the convention was the artistic director for the convention in two thousand seven. And it was just in that year when I was to see uh, Francois has the Paris opera is difficult to get tickets. It's, it's frequently sold out, but they have dress rehearsals where they will invite people who've been involved in the past. And Francois was, was invited. I think it was later mouse. And he invited me to come because I was, I was there and I met Terry and, and um, at just at, in that window of time, he had both, uh, he'd been sort of, acting as one of the two super soloists for the opera, but hadn't officially been given that position. And uh, he, he won that position and also was appointed to the Paris Conservatory in that same window within the same few months. So that changed things up. Now, he's always going to be first stint. But before, when he wasn't acting as super soloist, he'd be back in the section. Francois, there are some people who think that Francois was the principal based in the Paris opera. That's not true. He was back in the section. He was just, he was a, he was a section player. What an amazing background. And then also looking at Richard Davis, you know, earlier influence on you, you know, with his eclectic background and Francois, in addition, you know, I mean, he's this amazing, obviously soloist teacher played, played in opera orchestra, but he has a jazz background too. Jazz is a big, is a big part of his musicianship. Isn't that, isn't he a jazz or he's got some jazz background? Yeah. I mean, it's not necessarily the jazz that we, that we might think of if we're thinking about bebop you know, kind of straight ahead, hard swinging jazz. It's not necessarily like that, but it's definitely coming out of songbook jazz-like material. I mean, when he came, you know, when he came to Paris, he came to show Nani what he had done with his volume. Nani had been dead, and Francois started to get calls. And he was there with his brothers. He had a family band. So with his two brothers, one was a pianist and one was a drummer, and they were hired by Osnavar. So they toured with him. And Osnavar, for those that don't know, the best analogy that I can make is he was kind of like the Frank Sinatra of Europe. And so he began touring all over. So he was playing, you know, piano, bass and drums, accompanying the singer, you know? So yeah, it's, it's a lot like jazz. And, but he did, he did also, I mean, he subbed for, for Duke Ellington at, at one point, but he played with Edith Piaf and I mean, many of the, you know, the great artists over the years. I mean, he's, that's that's part of it. He, he speaks about some of this in interviews on the DVDs. He talks about, well, at my age and my experience, you know, you would expect I would get the call for this and this. There's some great stories. Well, man, I love this album. I was just reading. I was reading some of the details. So, you re- did you record all of this uh, in when you were over in Copenhagen and then coming back in 2012? Yeah, every everything on the record was re- was recorded on the one day. Okay. 
we were at Copenhagen for the base 2012 at the Opera House, and uh, Tom Larson, my, my colleague here at UNL, is a terrific composer and jazz player and writes a lot for films. He does a lot of work for PBS and uh, Discovery shows and all that kind of stuff. But he's very creative, and he's also very eclectic. He's not a classical player, and from a, from a pianist's perspective, he's not like I would consider to be a muscular... You know, he's not going to break out into some heavy stride thing. He's not, uh, you know, a physical player. He's a composer player. And so he's the one who, like Bill, you know, fascinated with Bill Evans. He, he'll tinker and tinker and he'll find these beautiful voicings and things. So I wanted to do a collaboration with him that was a sort of generally speaking, a crossover project, but it was really just music that incorporates some classical technique some uh, influences of Rabath, uh, Middle Eastern kinds of things, but straight ahead kinds of stuff, taking a little bit out of some of the you know free material from that piece. So just just a, a large mix of things, and that was what we presented in Copenhagen with Paris. The way that that kind of folded in uh, when we were working on the uh, on the second DVD, Francois called me called me over to the to the couch. He wanted to show me this thing on his computer, and I'm. Um, I'm looking and it's, it's the, oh, the test printing of, um, uh, one of the, the, the volumes of, of his, of his method, the publishing. And it was the, um, second concerto, which was the piece on Rabat's Live Around the World. That was his second concerto, uh, that he premiered. Uh, that was the work that he wrote for his, uh, Carnegie Hall debut back in the seven. Anyway, he showed me the title page and he had dedicated it to me. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that was, I mean, man, it doesn't get any hit. It was like I was having a really hard time holding it together. You know, that was, you know, you, you, you know, everybody will understand, you know, if you have somebody who has that kind of meaning in your life. So I had to learn peace and uh, then played it. He heard me play it uh, in D.C. A, a couple of times with Sylvain because um, Sylvain knew the, knew the piece. And Sylvain had to play the piano part to make sure it was correct when they were working on the on, on the method, getting the getting the getting the details out and then i played it in kansas city in um 2011 at the base kansas city base workshop johnny hamill's uh, base workshop and francois was said you know you need to you need to record this you need to play this and so sylvain uh, is also a great recording engineer and he's got access to all this so we through sylvain we made a reservation at studio devoe which is one of the uh, grand old studios this the room was unbelievable man it was 200 meters. It's a parquet floor. It was where all these Michel Legrand orchestra things were recorded. Nice. They had a, uh, yeah, a nine foot Fazioli handmade Italian piano. Mm. And you could hear a note walk out, have lunch, come back, it'd still be ringing. I mean, it was just, <laughs> just, a, and so they, they set up uh, six microphones for the bass and six for the piano. So two close, two medium, and then two out in the room. So all the reverb and everything is what you hear in the in the room. It's just, it's all. So we just, you know, we got in there, and um, I'm really there to do the concerto, and, you know, Tom understands that, but if we have more time, we're going to, you know, try to do our stuff, and we had a ball. We just kept on going, and, you know, we just had a, we had a great time and played until it was like, well, that's all the time we have, and so we'll see. What we, it's like a back of Jack box. We'll see what we get. You know. <laughs> so it really was. It really was a day in Paris. It was one day worth of. How much of the what you did with Tom was was written out? Because because definitely, I, you know, listening through, you've got some all these unison lines, and you got some stuff that definitely sounds improvised. Uh, what did you walk in with in terms of stuff that you already created? Right. That's a really good question. I mean, each each of the pieces uh, has. A, a a different way in. Uh-huh. So a Brownian motion is is getting some airplay right now, and that one's really you know I wrote that one in a Ray Brown style, and it's you know unison lines, and it's it, it, it's an odd form, it's a little bit longish the form, but the the chord changes are uh, you know there's two fives in chromatic motion, but I mean any jazz player could sit down and look at that and play. It's it's very very straight ahead, and the solos follow the form. On the other hand, you have a piece like, I don't know, well, uh, Lewis is, it's, it's, it's one of Tom's pieces. It's like a 1960s, there's a melody and there's some suggested harmonies, but it's really more an open improvisation based on that form. Some of the other ones like Prisms, it's an intricate uh, counterpoint. It's like a three-part counterpoint, two parts in the piano, one part in the bass. 
And then the improvisation is a collective improvisation. Okay. And so we're, uh, we're both improvising because the whole, that whole tune is about, well, it's about prisms. It's about seeing the different lights and everything. So it's, it's, it's about these different lines happening at the same time that still give you, uh, I don't want to get too esoteric about it, but it's like, you know, light is comprised of these different colors that are, that we can see and there's more beyond that. And so it's how they interact. And so we try to play in that. In, in that way. So each piece has the improvisation might be based on a harmonic structure, might be more melodic. The bulge might happen in a different way. Like in La Ferrera, there's a 15, eight against 12, eight that happens. And then it moves kind of into a more, when the 12, eight establishes itself. And then Tom kind of goes into this, then there's a lot of chordal chords. That's sort of the, that tune is a lot about chordal chords and then uh, minor seventh movement in fifths in the little, the, the little B section, but it's, uh, so he gets into these kind of McCoy-ish voicings, um, McCoy Tyner, uh, that, that, that kind of, the kind of, voice. so everything is a little bit, a little bit different. Some of them like the persistence is a really odd one because uh, it was just this idea about persistence. And so there's this form of harmonic changes, but the melody itself is just this descending fifth. And that's it. And, and it comes that you hear, it, you know, just coming here happens and then the changes kind of move around, and then you hear the two notes appear again, and the kind of thing. And when Tom first looked at that, he was like, "Are you nuts?" <laughs> <laughs> and now he's like, he's, he's like, "Wow, that really grew on me." It's it's, it's, it's like super minimalism. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, it's nice. It's a nice way to end the album. I I, I love the Sati piece too. That definitely sounds like his oh, piano yeah. music. That's 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 cool. And you got that groovy kind of what I think of as Raboth esque Boeing. Is that in the the Scott Lafaro? Isn't La, La Ferrera? Yeah, La Ferrera. Yeah. yeah. And that's, you know, I, yeah, I wrote, I wrote these pieces. Some of them are La Fuera and Brownian Motion are, uh, and Blantonim are all pieces that were written for, of course, great jazz bass players who wrote that. And, 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 they're, and they're based on puns on the name, some kind of uh, extra uh, communication. So La Fuera is La Hora, which is the, uh, the Pakistani city where you've got the Kuali, the, the, uh, the devotional singing, Nursat Fet Ali Khan, for those people that are into you know, long concerts of, demo- of devotional singing that, you know, you know, very intricate with, uh, you know, uh, percussion and they go on. He's got three brothers, I think, that sing with him and it's just marvelous stuff. So anyway, that's, it's, it's sort of influenced by the, well, the idea is anyhow that, that, you know, Scotty was very fluid on the bass and then bringing this other kind of Pakistani uh, influenced music to his, uh, to his fluidity. That was the idea. Yeah. Well, I got I got one more one more question for you because you're like you're a whirling dervish of double bass creativity and activity, and I mean you like albums and you're uh, all over the place and and like how and this I think people people find this very interesting. How do you? What's a day in the life of Hans Sturm on the double bass look like? Like how do you balance all these various things? Like your technique, keeping that up, your composing and improvising. How does that fit in? You're learning new repertoire. Like give us just a day. Or maybe an ideal day in the life <laughs> that doesn't involve travel. Well, an ideal day, an ideal day is like a, a three uninterrupted, three uninterrupted hours. You yeah, know? that's that's yeah, that 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 rarely happens. But right. f- for me, the the most important thing it's continuing to explore the bass with scales and arpeggios, mm-hmm. and bringing things to the table like Francois' third volume, like Hal Robinson's uh, stroking. Board walking is also very helpful. Although, I mean, when you understand it, you go through the book, then you can begin to see variations you can derive yourself. Yeah, sure. So I, I, but I encourage students to get through that. So I spent, I, I found this app called iTabla Pro. Mm. And it's, I, I love to practice with a drone. Yeah. And I love to practice with different drones. So, uh, and, and it has grooves too. If you want to set the tabla, I mean, it'll play eight and a half beats a measure if you want. I mean, it will really that mess you up. So it's, but it's, it's a lot of fun to play with just, just to play with that drone. And th- in the beginning, it's okay for students, especially to play, you know, you're going to play a G major scale. So you put the drone on G or you're going to play a G major scale. So you put the drone on D at the fifth or at the root. But I like keeping a drone and feeling the, the tension of dissonance where the drone might be at a tritone away from the key I'm working in, mm. you know, or, mm-hmm. or, or it's working to stretch my ears in different ways, but slow scales with the bow and then uh, lots of rhythmic stuff with the bow, a uh, variety of, of fingerings. I love the uh, Galamian arpeggios. I use those sequence of uh, 10 triads 
easily found. It comes out of, of the Carl Flesch stuff. And then working with uh, different shifting styles and techniques. So really, it's just technique and, and listening, getting the bass to respond and resonate and try different things. And then when it comes to pieces, I mean, when I'm, when I'm working on a piece, I mean, it's really, for me, it's, it's about setting frames. And I think this is a really important practice technique that doesn't get used. And I try to tell my students about this and get them to work on it. But it's too tempting to start in the upper left-hand corner, bulldoze till you make a mistake, fart around, and go back to the beginning again. And uh, what winds up happening is then I say, you know, you've got, you've got a really shiny doorknob at the back of the house is falling off. You <laughs> never, never, quite, never quite get there. But that, just that idea of going to those places and... Uh, being very careful about listening to what you're doing, you know, use the drone, use the metronome and control, you know, because I, I've come to believe over the years from a teaching standpoint that there aren't as many accidents as we might like to think there are. You know, when somebody, when somebody makes a mistake, it's because they've been playing something in a way that's, that's incorrect. And that that's, that comes in and then you have to unlearn it, you know? So listening first, I think is exceedingly important to get, to get that element, you know, one, again, getting back to the senses, one thing at a time, you know, listening first, getting that in your system. I, I saw this with the brilliantly done by John Clayton. I, I went with him. He was in, he had written some arrangements for my wife, for Jackie Allen, these, these orchestral arrangements. And we were working on them and he came to town while he was on his way traveling elsewhere. He made a connection at Butler university and came down to work with their big band. He had them listen to the tune twice. First time, just hear it. Second time, he had them turn the, music, turn the music over so they could see the notes and listen to it again. Then he had them play it. And the amount of information that they took in just from listening and then looking, when, they got, when it got time to put you know, the horn to their face, they were uh, really ready to, uh, to, to play because they had a, a deeper understanding. And how, how often do we have students, we give them a new piece that they don't really know and they haven't listened to and they, they throw it up on the stand and they make a mistake. And as Jeff is fond of saying, first in the computer, first out, you know, you, that, that mistake becomes associated with that moment in the piece and then you have to unlearn it. And gee, what a drag that is. So setting the frames, by that I mean the frame you're always wanting to practice for performance, meaning you always want to perform. So the frame might be one bar. You play that bar, then you judge after. Or you play that four bars, then you judge after, so that you don't ever stop. You stop when you say you're going to stop, because you've chosen to stop there, not I'm going to stop when I make a mistake, because that becomes then your instinctual habit when you're performing live. Yeah. When you make a mistake, yeah. and you're going to make a mistake. Mm -hmm. Sure, right, exactly. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> We're all going to make a mistake. <laughs> then your first inclination is to stop and to try to fix it, but it's not fixable. It's too late. It's, it's already out there. So, so it's, it's better to, to get in the habit of playing, of playing through the thing. So working in that way and then doing, as Francois would say, disassociative practice, you know, taking, taking the rhythm out, reordering the notes. What, what are these? Is this a scale? Is this a pedio? How does this work? moving it around the base in different places, playing, you know, just playing around with and coming to a, a I call it the disco ball of pedagogy, you know, <laughs> lot, lots of, lots of different lights, you know, yeah, play right. around with it in different ways and get excited. And then the work that you have done will have legs and will be applicable in other situations yeah. where if you only work in the way to get through this particular piece, this way, uh, the, the, the amount of information that's transferable is, much less than if you take it apart and play with it and move it to some different keys and try in mm -hmm. different rhythms and different parts of the bass. Mm -hmm. Then you, you, you become, it, it helps you to become much deeper, I think. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I love, I love the, I like the disco ball analogy. That's <laughs> <laughs> For those of us who grew up in the seventies, you know, <laughs> <laughs> what well, I like the, I, I like the idea of, I've got to try this with some of my own students because I give them something, whether it's uh, just a one student or whether it's an ensemble or something, and we listen to it, but the music is in front of them. I like the idea of just listening and just experiencing that without any any visual, and then then look and then play it. That's that three level approach. I like that a lot. 
Well, in that way, you don't, because, you know, the, 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 the other analogy I wind up using is, you know, you like a steak, you like it with mushrooms, you like it with cheese, you like it with caramelized onions. Oh, yeah. Great. Now, shove that whole thing in your mouth at the same t- at one time. You know, you, yeah. when you're engaging that number of senses at once, mm-hmm. it's too confusing. You know, yeah. the, it, and, and that's why, you know, the other, the other piece of this is when you're practicing for pitch, practice for pitch. Yeah. Right. When you're practicing for tone, don't worry about the pitch anymore. It, it, that, that tends to become a distraction, and then we, we don't have that singular focus. So it's perfectly all right to practice for tone and ignore the pitch. That's fine. To say that might sound like sacrilege, but when you practice, but practice for pitch, mm-hmm, right, <laughs> you know, right, right, put on the drone right. and, and focus on that, on that also, but b- b- using these different, uh, dividing up by the census, I think is, is really significant. And I see real progress pretty fast from students who will kind of take this to heart and, and work that way. Thanks again, Hans, for this great conversation. And be sure to check Hans out on his website, hanssturm.com. And thank you so much for listening. You've reached the end of another episode of the podcast. And I appreciate you listening to this so much. I can't even tell you. And I know you could be doing a lot of things with your time right now. And I'm honored that you're spending time with me and with Hans. And I really hope it's time well spent learning about this base world, getting inspired, getting new ideas. That's the point of this podcast. And I just thank you so much for tuning in. And be sure to visit our website for more details about the mission of this podcast, what I'm trying to do here with this podcast. And I can't wait to see you again soon for more life in the low end of the spectrum.